Our, our uh, third lecture series is by Kristen Lauder from Facebook Research, and she will be telling us about a field that she's done a great deal of important work in super singular isogeny graphs in cryptography. Well, thank you, Kristen. Great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all for joining. Um, I'd like to start by uh, introducing Jana Sotakova, who's uh, the TA for the course, who's um, prepared excellent um, exercises and a lot of kind of supplementary con uh, content, which um, will be hopefully very useful and a lot of fun uh, for you to engage with. So um, let, let me start uh, right away because I definitely have more than 50 minutes of content. So I might need to be cut off at, so, at some point uh, if, I'm, if I'm going too long, but I will try to compress it. So in order to talk about super singular isogeny graphs in cryptography, there's a lot of words there to um, specify and get into more detail. Uh, and I'm gonna start at the end. I'm gonna start a little bit about cryptography and then um, explain about uh, the graphs and the, in particular, super singular isogeny graphs. So uh, just so that everyone is on the same page, I'm sure some of you already know quite a bit about cryptography, but this is the motivation for the topic. So um, I thought it would be silly to start without giving the motivation. Um, so in general, the cryptography is the science of keeping secrets, uh, but it's more than that. It's also used for, um, uh, besides confidentiality, it's also used to assure authenticity. And the main tools besides encryption, decryption, which is probably the main thing that you know about, are uh, digital signatures and key exchange. And digital signatures and key exchange are right now the, uh, the topic of an ongoing NIST competition. So NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, government agency in the US, but they run international competitions to select cryptographic primitives. And often these, the standards that they um, establish are used around the world. And the NIST is currently running a five-year post-quantum cryptography competition. And they are focused on choosing um, new key exchange uh, primitives and new digital signature uh, primitives. And so um, what I wanted to make sure that you all kind of know the context here, and that is that um, the, these main building blocks, uh, key exchange um, is really just to, uh, a protocol for two parties to agree upon a common secret using only um, publicly in exchanged information. Uh, signatures allow parties to authenticate themselves. And um, obviously encryption um, allows you to preserve the confidentiality of, of data. So the common uh, public key crypto systems in use around the world today in, in industry and in you know, all kinds of um, uh, systems on the internet are RSA, Diffie-Hellman, elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman, uh, digital signatures, which is DSA and elliptic curve DSA. So um, you may uh, be familiar with this already, but if not, I mean, you're using these systems every day in your, in your daily life. Uh, starting from you know secure browser sessions whenever you want to buy something online, which is uh, governed by the standards for the um, HTTPS uh, standards for uh, secure socket layer SSL or the modernized version of that, which is TLS. Um, there's standards which um, define how to do encrypted uh, signed encrypted email, which is SMIME. Unfortunately, SMIME is not very widely used. Uh, so most people are generally not using signed encrypted email, although maybe that's changing a little bit. Virtual private networking is governed by standards for IPsec and authentication of uh, messages and content is generally done via certificates, which in the US is governed by the um, uh, <clears throat> the ITU section of the, the um, the UN ITU X509 certificates. So what you can hope, I know that was like a lot of, a lot of random names if you're not familiar with cryptographic standards, but 
Um, the point that you should get out of this slide is, is that the way that mathematics ends up getting into use in practice is through a complicated interaction of government agencies, academic researchers, researchers in government, and researchers in industry working together. And in the case um, of these systems that I've mentioned, all of this has happened over the last three or four decades to make sure that um, these systems, RSA and EC, elliptic curve based systems are used. Um, but so, so far I haven't really said, um, sorry, I'm gonna exchange the order of these two slides. Uh, the, the, uh, the way that the mathematics is used here is, is that the security of these crypto systems is based on hard problems in mathematics, such as factoring large integers. So the RSA system is based on the difficulty of factoring large integers. Uh, Diffie-Hellman systems are usually based, they have to be based on some kind of a, essentially a cyclic abelian group. So you can use the discrete logarithm problem in Z mod PZ star. Um, I haven't said what the discrete logarithm problem is. I'll, I'll say that in just a minute. Um, there is another cyclic abelian group that we can use for the discrete logarithm problem, and that is elliptic curve groups, and I'll tell you about that in just a second. And then there's another thing which we don't talk about as much, um, it's more recent and it's not as widely deployed, and that is pairing-based systems which are using the VEI pairing on elliptic curves or variants of the, of the VEI pairing. So since one of the um, main objectives in this lecture is to um, talk about graphs that involve uh, elliptic curves. And a lot of the exercise that Jana have prepared involve elliptic curves. I wanted to um, at least just kind of present the basics here. So I'm sure that many of you do already know a lot about elliptic curves, um, but if you don't, um, I'm just presenting just, just one slide. This is not a whole you know, graduate course in elliptic curves. Um, but uh, so you can have kind of the basics. And this is honestly the way that cryptographers really think about elliptic curves. So, you know, when I was in graduate school, I learned about, you know, schemes and sheaves and studied, you know, um, you know, EGA and SGA and all of these things. And I don't think I ever saw an equation for a curve ever. Um, but in fact, um, in, the, in the industry and in, um, you know, especially computer scientists uh, using um, mathematical objects such as elliptic curves and mathematicians that work at the interface of computer science, uh, you can simply uh, think of an elliptic curve as being defined by an equation. So what you first do is you specify your underlying base field. And for cryptography, it's always going to be a finite field. In general, um, for elliptic curve cryptography, it's going to be a large prime field. So we're going to specify a large prime P. I've tried to put the mathematical notion in a notation in green here and um, I, to italicize it. And the, the large prime is going to define the base, base field FP. So I'm sorry, my PowerPoint skills did not include being able to put a bar over an FP. So FP bar is mean, means the algebraic closure of, of FP. And so um, an elliptic curve over FP or FP bar when P is very large, in, in, in other words, greater than three, like if P is not equal to two or three, then you can convert the general Weierstrass equation for an elliptic curve into a short Weierstrass equation. So it's just given um, by two coefficients, these, these constants A and B, which come from the base field, and Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B defines the curve, and the points on the curve are just um, the uh, X comma Y, which satisfy this equation. Now, this is just an affine equation for the curve, and it does not tell you the whole picture. What you should really do is think of like a um, homogenized version of this equation uh, in projective space. So you would add a variable Z and um, homogenize this. And then you could see that there's also a point at infinity and there's a group law on this, on this curve. And again, I'm, I'm, because I don't have a lot of time and the group law is not 
um, as important for the application I'm going to talk about. I'm not showing you the usual picture of the chord, chord and tangent method, which is how you can um, see the group law on this algebraic curve. So the nice thing about the elliptic curves is, is they have both this geometric aspect, which is they're given by an equation, and they have the algebraic side, which is, is that they have a group law. And you couldn't do cryptography on these uh, objects if you didn't have the group law. So um, like I said, the group law is just, you know, this chord and, and tangent method, which takes two points on the curve and passes a line through it and looks for the third point of intersection. And um, the uh, basically in more fancy language, you could say that in the divisor class group, the divisor of this um, line is the, these three points of intersection. And so that is uh, zero in the divisor class group. So that means that the sum of the two points must be minus the, the third point. So now we have these elliptic curves. They're given by an equation. They have a group. They have a group law. So there's two other things that I would like you to know about um, elliptic curves for the purpose of this lecture and this the focus of this kind of short course. And that is, is that elliptic curves are very convenient um, for cryptography because they have a very nice compact label, which is called the J invariant. So the J invariant is simply a rational function in the coefficients that define the curve. So it, you can see A and B. So it's 1728 times 4A cubed in the numerator and 4A cubed plus 27B squared in the denominator. And um, this is actually an, an isomorphism invariant of elliptic curves over FP bar. So just a little, uh, just a little note here. I, I noticed something in the exercises that uh, Jana prepared, and so I was just gonna give you a little heads up or a little um, highlight a fact, and that is, is that um, so two elliptic curves will have the same J invariant if they're isomorphic over FP bar, and it, it can be the case you can have two elliptic curves defined over FP, and they're not isomorphic over FP. So, but they could have the same, they could be isomorphic over FP bar. So that's because you're allowing isomorphism that are defined over the larger field. Uh, so another thing I wanted to call out is, is that super singular elliptic curves, a lot of times I'll be using the word super singular. And the funny thing is, is that in the applications in, in the cryptographic world these days uh, with super singular isogeny graphs, a, a, a lot of people are able to implement and uh, work on these graphs without even ever knowing what the word super singular means. Because actually once the graphs are there and the elliptic curves are there, you kind of don't need to really think about it. But all of the mathematics behind these graphs depends on the fact that we're going to be thinking about um, super singular elliptic curves. So if uh, you read Silverman's beautiful text on elliptic curves, um, you'll see, you know, multiple definitions of super singular and, sh and shows the equivalence uh, between different definitions. I'm just going to give you one, which is um, the kind of the easiest to state is, is that elliptic curve modulo P, like over uh, some uh, finite field of characteristic P, it is super singular if there are no P torsion points, not, o not over the field of definition, nor over any extension uh, field. So no, no P torsion. And so another fact that we kind of need is, is that the isomorphism class, and uh, the FP bar isomorphism class of uh, any super singular elliptic curve contains a representative, which is defined over FP or FP. Um, squared. So that means that in, in shorthand, you may hear me say like super singular elliptic curves are defined over FP or FP bar. That, that's not exactly right. What it means is, is that every super singular elliptic curve has an equivalent, you know, has a representative in its equivalence class, which is defined over FP or FP, uh, FP, or FP squared. Uh, and then finally, the last fact which we're going to use, and this is what we'll get into more in the second and third lectures, is that the endomorphism ring of a super singular elliptic curve is actually isomorphic to a maximal order in a definite quaternion algebra. And we'll talk about that more in uh, subsequent lectures. So endomorphism ring just means the set of um, 
basically rational maps on the elliptic curve and elliptic curves because they have a group law are very nice. They have um, multiplication by an integer. So Z, the, the integers is automatically in the endomorphism ring of an elliptic curve because you can take any integer, uh, you know, just let's take the integer three, you can multiply a point by three. That just means adding the point to itself three times, P plus P, P plus P. And um, there's also the notion of negation. Uh, you can see that even geometrically. So you've got the integers in the endomorphism ring and over uh, a finite field, you always have Frobenius. So if I call Frobenius pi, Frobenius is just the map that takes uh, the coordinate, coordinate wise, x comma y goes to x to the p comma y to the p. So you always have the Frobenius map for elliptic curves. But in addition, if it's super singular, you have extra automorphisms that turns this into a rank four um, a Z module. And uh, like I said, we'll get into that a little bit more later. Okay, so there's one other notion that I really wanted to talk about before introducing uh, super singular isogeny graphs and um, some of the, um, the hard problems here. So when I said, you know, Systems that are deployed today around the world that use, you know, on the internet that use um, uh, hard mathematical problems. I, I gave you some examples. You know, I just throw these words out there hard mathematical problems. Yeah. So, what does that mean? Well, I realized after giving this kind of lecture for a while that a lot of very famous mathematicians actually really had no idea what I meant by that. And that's because in mathematics, a lot of times we think, what does it mean to be a hard mathematical problem? Well, we think that it means that um, there's a conjecture that no one has proved yet. That's what people generally mean by hard mathematical problem. But that's not at all what we mean by hard mathematical problem in cryptography. So I realized that it would be very important to specify this. What we mean by hard mathematical problem is that um, you set up some system and you specify how many bits does it take you to represent elements in this system. So let's say your input is represented by n m bits. I've got the m in green here, little m. So that as an example, that in the previous system, I just talked about elliptic curve cryptography, a and b were for, from a finite field fp and p, you know, both P and A and B can rep be represented in roughly log P bits. So that would be M would be like log P in that case. Down at the bottom of this slide, you see like from the RSA system where you have a large, large integer little n, which is actually the product of two primes, P and Q. Um, the num all the elements in your system are integers modulo n, and they all take you m bits to represent where m is log m. So then what we mean by hard mathematical problem is that the best known attack on the system runs in exponential time. So to compare, I've written, sorry, the sentence doesn't make a lot of sense the way it is. It's the, the best known attacks uh, sh should run in exponential time, but I've also written here, what does it mean to run in exponential time? What does it mean to run in sub-exponential time or polynomial time? So exponential time basically means it's O of, uh, you know, some power of M, like some exponential function in M, like two to the M. The O notation, if you're not familiar with it, it just means that Whatever the actual running time is, it's proportional to the time that I've got written in, in the parentheses here. And um, so sub, sub exponential, so polynomial should be pretty clear. That means that the running time of the best known attack is polynomial in M. And so the, the middle case here, the sub, sub exponential formula is a little bit um, more uh, complicated to write down, but it's basically, the exponent is just like a fractional power of m, you know, where the, the fraction is between, you know, zero and one. So uh, exponential time is um, like two, two to the m. And what we're trying to get is this asymmetry between the number of bits that it takes you to write stuff down and communicate 
and the amount of time it takes an attacker to attack you. So that's what we're trying to capture with this notation, exponential time. And that's because basically, you know, people want privacy and security, but they don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay for it in time that they wait for a system to, you know, uh, give give them the outcome that they're looking for, and they don't want to pay for it in you know overhead and bandwidth and compute cost, all of these things, and the time and and compute cost and bandwidth are all proportional to the size of the of the inputs. So you want your input size to be small, and you want your running time for your attacker to be large. So that's why we quantify it. So that's what we mean by hard mathematical problem. We don't want we don't mean um, that you have to prove the uh, Riemann hypothesis. Okay, so at the risk of um, going over time, let's see, so I've uh, uh, been talking for about 20 minutes. I'm gonna very briefly talk about the context of um, quantum, quantum computers and quantum algorithms. So the issue for all of these systems that I've mentioned, these public key crypto systems that are in use around the world today, is that they will all be broken once we have a full scale quantum computer that it can be, can be realized and do com um, you know, uh, computation at scale. So the reason for that is, is that in the mid 90s, Shor introduced an algorithm for factoring um, that runs on a quantum computer. So we call them uh, quantum algorithms. And the, this quantum algorithm is polynomial time for factoring. So it's a quantum polynomial al time algorithm. And for an M bit input, so if M is log N and N is the modulus for RSA, uh, it runs in roughly four M cubed time and it requires two M qubits. So the point is, is that in today's classical world, um, uh, minimum size for, I'll, I'll just pause for one second. Does anybody know the minimum size for RSA moduli that are used today in, in practice? You don't have to say anything because I, I don't know if anybody wants to unmute, but um, I just wanted to give you a time to, to think about it. If you if you know, you know, if, you, if you've never heard it, then you probably don't know. But uh, it's a trick question because it is on the second part of my slide here on the bottom where it says RSA M equals 2048. So roughly 2000 bits. That's the minimum size that's in use today. So that means that we're going to need a more than 4,000 bit um, Q, you know, uh, quantum computer that can handle more than 4,000 qubits in order to break this. But once we have that, it'll be a, kind of a trivial running time. Four times m cubed is, is very small. Um, and same thing for elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, so an elliptic, elliptic curve cryptography um, will require roughly 6 m qubits and roughly 360 times m cubed time. And, but if you look down on the very bottom of the slide, elliptic curve cryptography uses smaller bit size like m equals 256 or now 384 with the newer guidance. Because um, for RSA, we do know sub classical sub-exponential attacks. Whereas for elliptic curve crypto, we only have in the classical world, we only have exponential attacks. And that's why we have a smaller smaller bit size for elliptic curve cryptography. Um, so uh, moving on this, so the quantum, the result of this quantum kind of threat is that we need to figure out new systems, kind of new hard problems, mathematical problems to use as a basis of uh, crypto systems for the future when we have um, quantum computers at scale. So the timing, and this kind of spans um, in my career, uh, I was at Microsoft Research for 22 years, and I um, worked for my first five years on getting elliptic curve uh, cryptography deployed in my Microsoft products. And uh, they started being deployed roughly in 2006, around the time when US government started requiring it for all uh, U.S. government contractors. Um, the Suite B requirements came out and required the use of elliptic curve cryptography and set um, the bit lengths to be used. 
Uh, roughly 10 years later, um, the CNSA uh, document came out and the re increased the required mi minimum bit length for ECC from 256 to 384 with no explanation, but we could assume that it had something to do with um, the progress on building quantum computers. Um, but they also discontinued the mandatory, mandatory adoption of ECC. And in 2017, launched the, and this launched the international competition to select new candidates. So very quickly, I'd love to tell you about all these different new directions for in the NIST PQC competition, but I don't have time um, given that we want to focus on the supersingular isogeny graph. So I'll just mention the different um, streams, the different areas of mathematics that have been proposed and are being considered actively in this competition. Um, so code-based cryptography was first introduced by McLeese in 1978, based on the hardness of decoding random linear codes. Multivariate cryptosystems, first introduced by Matsumoto and Amai in 1988, uh, based on the hardness of solving um, systems of uh, multivariate equations, um, nonlinear systems, um, obviously, otherwise they would, it would just be linear algebra. Um, Lattice-based cryptography was first introduced by Hofstein, Pfeiffer, and Silverman in 96, and when they launched the Entru company, um, based on the hardness of finding um, short vectors in uh, large dimensional lattices. Um, and then supersingular isogeny graphs, which is what I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about here today, were introduced uh, by myself with uh, Charles and Gorin in 2005, actually at the NIST hash function competition in 2005. So, but for all of you thinking about, you know, um, areas to go into, you know, for your thesis, uh, there's a lot of material here and there's a lot of urgency too. all of these problems. Um, need to be addressed because we have to see first, you know, if there are there are classical algorithms to attack these things, and then whether there are uh, quantum algorithms. So it's kind of double double the work. Um, so I highly encourage all of you to look at um, any any or more of these problems that you might be interested in. Okay, so now um, I'd like to shift over for the last uh, basically 25 minutes to super singular isogeny graphs. So the new hard problem that we introduced into cryptography for the NIST hash function competition in 2005 is basically finding paths in these graphs. So think about a graph. A graph just means a set of vertices and edges. So um, Ver the vertices are, are connected by edges and in all in this whole talk and everything I'll be talking about to me these edges are undirected. Um, that just kind of makes it easy easier it just means an edge is something that connects um, to two vertices but you'll see in the definition that they look to begin with to, to have a direction, but we can kind of make our graphs undirected. Um, with some extra conditions. We also, um, for our uh, proposal of the hash function, we also uh, assumed that we're dealing with K regular graphs. So K regular just means that every vertex has K edges coming out of it. And we're also interested in graphs with kind of optimal expansion properties. Um, so that's related to the Ramanujan properties of these graphs. So I'll say about that, a little bit about that in, in a minute. But as you can see that if you want to use this problem uh, of finding paths in the graph as a hard problem for cryptography, the underlying assumption is that finding those paths is hard, or in other words, there's no known efficient routing algorithm. So I actually, uh, I love to just pause and, and give this little story. At one time, I heard a lovely talk by Ron Graham about um, uh, graphs that had um, uh, that have efficient routing algorithms, and I forgot the formulation of, of exactly of what he was saying, but it's basically saying that um, you know graphs that have some kind of an isometry to the hypercube are um, 
graphs where you have a, a good routing algorithm. So when you think of that, um, so I, I also, I'd like to give the example of a hypercube. I'm not sure if I, I don't think I have it in my slides here, so I'll just say it. So the hypercube, what is the hypercube when you think of it as a graph? So let's fix some bit length. Let's just say N, you've got N bits, zeros and ones. And every vertex in the graph is a bit string of length N. So those are the vertices. And what are the edges? Well, two vertices are connected if they just differ by one bit. So if you can just take the bit string and flip one bit and then the next uh, bit string that you get, that's connected by an edge. If you have to flip two bits, then it's not connected to that one. So that's the hyper hypergraph. And so now I'm going to give you two bit strings, two random bit strings, zeros and ones. And how do you find a path from one to the other? Well, it's very easy. You just go through bit by bit. If it matches, you don't do anything. If it doesn't match, then you flip that bit and that's one step in your graph because that's an edge, just flipping one bit. And so now you quickly have a path between these two things. You've just flipped the bits that needed to be flipped so that they would match. Well, then the one thing that you could probably see is that you could have flipped those bits where they differed in any order. So there's actually a lot of different paths in that graph and you can find them easily. So this is a terrible idea for a cryptographic uh, system, right? So you would not want to take the hypercube. So what instead what we're doing is we're trying to come up with some nice mathematical construction of a graph where it's easy to write down what the graph is or like what the elements of, the, you don't wanna to have to write down the whole graph because it's of exponential size, it's really large. But you wanna be able to specify vertices and edges in your graph really easily, but still have it really hard to find paths between two random vertices. Okay, so hopefully that gives you the idea of what type of graph we want to use for crypto, um, crypto applications. So now I'm going to tell you about the hash function that we propose. The CGL hash function is, uh, so first of all, let me tell you what a hash function is. Um, all of those protocols that I mentioned in the beginning that are cryptographic protocols for you know, key exchange for secure browser sessions, for signed encrypted email, for certificates, everything, all cryptographic protocols use hash functions. So it's an incredibly important building block in cryptography. And they're usually modeled as a random oracle, which kind of means like they're, they're magic, like they magically give you some random value and there's no correlation. And so uh, here, uh, a hash function maps bit strings of some finite length to bit strings of some other finite length. Very typical will be where little n here is much, much bigger than little, uh, little m. Sorry, I've used little n and little m in other places in the slides for other meanings here, just you know, two random sizes. And if n is way bigger than little m, then it'll be um, very, it'll be like, uh, um, efficient or good from the point of view of compressing. Like, so uh, if you've got a large, you know, video file and you want some hash of it to be like um, a little bit of a, um, oh, I forgot what they call it, a tag or something for the, um, for the movie. Uh, M would be very small, typically like 256 bits, whereas N could be extremely large. So as you can see, if N is extremely large and M is small, then of course there's going to be, um, it's, it's not going to be injective, right? There's going to be um, a lot of, there's potentially a lot of collisions. Uh, and so what you want for a cryptographic hash function is that the function H is public easy to compute. It's, you know, unkeyed doesn't require a secret key to compute it, but also collision resistant, which doesn't mean that there are no collisions. Like I just said, if N is much larger than M, then definitely there's tons of collisions. It's just that it's really hard to find them. So another thing is, is that you don't really want the, the output to be biased in these M bits. So that's why it's nice to have a uniformly distributed output. Um, it's not necessarily a cryptographic requirement, but if there is bias, then there will be ways to take advantage of it to compromise the system. So the de definition of collision resistance is just that if it's computationally infeasible 
to find two inputs which hash to the same output. So two inputs X and Y such that H of X equals H of Y. And a hash function is pre-image resistant if given any output of the hash function, it's hard to find an input which hashes to that output. So um, this, uh, this um, cryptographic hash function that we defined based on, in general, based on expander graphs, but in a minute we'll see in particular on super singular isogeny graphs, is um, you take a K regular uh, uh, graph and you have to assume also that every vertex in the graph has a label. You're gonna need labels for your system. And what you do is you take the input to the hash function. It's a, a long bit string, like I said, of, of length n. And you divide it into blocks. Each block is used to determine the next step in a walk around the graph. So you'll have some starting point specified, some initial vertex that's specified. And then you uh, decide, you read off your bit string, which is the input to the hash function block by block. Each block is used to determine which edge to follow at your next step. And very importantly, no backtracking is allowed. So you're not allowed to take a step and then the, your next step go back to the vertex where you were. That's called backtracking and that's never allowed. Um, so, that, uh, so those are the rules for kind of walking around the graph starting at your first initial point. And then um, when you finish your walk, like when you finish going through the whole bit string, which was the input, then the output of the hash function is the label for the last vertex that you landed on. So that's the definition of hash function in general. That's the um, uh, cryptographic hash function from expander graphs. Um, so there's there's a couple of things um, to uh, to specify here or to, or to think about. And that is, um, so what does it mean to be collision resistant in this? So I'm um, just drew a little piece of one of these graphs here. And like I said, you don't ever want to have to actually write down the whole graph because they're exponentially large, they're too large. But as you're walking along, I have shown you some air arrows here. And I don't mean that this is a directed graph. I'm sorry if that's confusing. I just mean that this is the direction that I'm walking in. So I'm going to start up here. And let's say it's a three regular graph and that uh, undirected and that um, as we walk along this, as we take this input, you see this input up at the top 110, that's the input to the hash function. You read the hash function off bit by bit for a three regular graph. Why? Because no backtracking is allowed other than the very first step is a little bit of an issue, but no backtracking is allowed. So that means you can never go back to where you came from. So at every point, you only have two choices for where to go. And two choices is specified by one bit. So as you go through the input to the hash function, you just go through it bit by bit. So the blocks are size one here. So for example, for the first, um, for the first bit, it's a one. So we're gonna go along the edge labeled one. The second bit is a one, so we're gonna go along the next edge labeled one, and then the third bit is a zero. And then the output would be this, the label of this final vertex. So that's how the kind of the hash function works. And so then what does it mean to have a collision? A collision would mean um, that there were two uh, paths that kind of ended up at the same um, end point and so if you had, and this is undirected, what that would mean is that the, if they weren't the same path, then that means that there would be some cycle. You would have found a cycle in this graph. Um, so um, the, other, the, the other thing, I, I think I've kind of covered um, this, this slide already and I only have, yeah, 10 minutes left. Um, so I, I guess I, I still wanna, I just wanna comment. This idea of taking a random walk around an expander graph is a very standard idea in computer science. This is not some. This is not an idea that we introduced. It's an it's an idea that's used throughout computer science for randomized algorithms. Um, and the only thing that's really different here, and also which leads us to consider supersingular isogeny graphs, is is that 
we um, want to have the extra property that it's hard to invert these walks. So the walks and random walks themselves on, our, on expander graphs um, are a well-known way to, to generate a um, roughly uniformly distributed output. So uh, because of time, I had to skip all of my uh, slides about expander graphs, but expander graphs are basically, um, just think of them as being like K regular undirected graphs where there's a, um, an expansion constant C that means that whenever you take um, any like um, subset of the graph, which is like up to half of the vertices of the graph, and you look at all of its neighbors that are not already in the subset, that the number of new neighbors that you get will be uh, proportional to like C times the size of the graph. So you get some constant um, like um, factor of expansion from ev every set. So expander graphs, um, there's a lot of beautiful theorems about their behavior and how they're related to like the adjacency matrix for the expander graph, uh, which I might mention later in the number theoretic, th theoretic context. Um, uh, but here, the, the main thing that's different from the general philosophy in computer science of using random walks on expander graphs is that we want expander graphs where um, routing is hard, finding collisions and finding paths is hard. Um, so uh, Ramanujan graphs are graphs um, that we have beautiful constructions from number theory for and that are optimal expander graphs in some kind of as asymptotic sense. Um, so I'm not sure if we'll have time to come back to the actual definition there. Um, but um, the um, I'm going to just skip over. I already kind of told you about collisions. but. Um, this brings us to a construction of the Ramanujan graphs from, from uh, number theory, which is very beautiful and which is the kind of foundation for our crypto system. So these graphs are often attributed to either Pizer or Mestra, depending on what kind of number theory you like. Pizer introduced them in the context of um, quaternion algebras, Mestra in the context of modular forms. There's beautiful connections to both of those areas. Um, so hopefully it won't be um, a fight over who's, uh, <laughs> whose name you should uh, associate. Um, so the vertices of the graphs that we propose, the super, so now I'm finally getting to explain my title, super singular isogeny graphs. The vertices are going to be isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves, mod P meaning like over FP bar, and um, as I said, there's a theorem which assures that each isomorphism class will have a representative defined over FP or FP squared. And um, so that means that when you take the J invariant, all the J invariants will either be in FP or in FP squared. So they take lo basically log P or two log P bits to represent. And um, that's important because you have to actually implement these systems. And so you want to have like a finite, you know, you want to know how many computer words you need in order to represent your labels for your vertices. Okay, so secondly, um, the, uh, the, the edge, the isogenies are going to be the edges. So the vertices are isomorphism classes of super singular elliptic curves, and the edges are going to be isogenies. So what is an isogeny? So isogenies are um, basically uh, birational maps between these elliptic curves, uh, but I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm going to kind of flip over to the algebraic side here. So an elliptic curve, in addition to being a geometric object, it's also just, it's a group. It's a, the group of points on the elliptic curve are an abelian group. So if you want to take a, um, an abelian group and map to another abelian group, one way to do that is to just take a subgroup and quotient by that subgroup. So isogenies are basically, you should just think of them as taking the group of points and quotienting by some uh, subgroup. Now, if P is super large, P is the, the, um, the prime field here, and the degree, so um, the degree of your isogeny is basically going to be the size of that subgroup that you've quotient by. And if the degree is co-prime to P, if, um, 
L is going to be the degree, and let's say L is going to be very small for efficiency reasons, like L is equal to two or three. And again, P is very large. If L is co-prime to P, which is always going to be the situation for us in the crypto uh, applications, then um, we actually uh, can think of um, all the isogenies are separable, and we can think of them as being entirely determined by their kernel. So all of these are theorems that are proved, like in Silverman's uh, book, if you want to go and, and, and read the, the theorems and the proofs. But what it means in practice is, is that even though, you know, these birational maps between these algebraic, you know, objects, algebraic geometric objects might seem very complicated. In fact, in practice, in the applications, all you're going to be doing is quotienting by a subgroup, and it's a small subgroup. And so um, I'm going to show you the um, the formulas for the for the subgroup. And again, I'll, I'm rushing a little bit um, because I'm running out of time, but I'll make these uh, slides available as well. Is that the um, for example, if you take just a two torsion point on the elliptic curve, which in a large characteristic is just given by a point Q with uh, X coordinate equal to R and the Y coordinate will be zero because that's what makes it a two torsion point. And um, if you take that is the group generated by it is just itself and the identity. And if you take the elliptic curve um, given by this equation, Y squared equals X cubed plus AX plus B and you quotient by this point Q by this subgroup generated by Q, you will get the elliptic curve E2 that I've written the formula there for. So you can see how simple it is. You can see how the coefficients of the new curve depend on the coefficients of the previous curve in terms of A and B, and then involving R as well, the X coordinate of the two torsion point. And then um, you can see what the actual maps are. Um, and these are called uh, Velu's formulas. I'm not sure if I have the general um, no, I don't have the general formula for, for Velu because it looks a little complicated in, in, um, if it's not a two torsion point, but this is Velu's formulas just for two torsion points. So in the exercises, uh, I think Yana will have you working on some super singular isogeny graphs for small primes and taking walks around the graph using two torsion points. So you basically just be using um, these formulas to kind of compute the new elliptic curve, compute the J invariant of the new elliptic curve, et cetera. And um, you can see how easy it is to do, like even like on pencil and paper, you'd be able to do this yourself. But in particular, there are, um, you know, the computer algebra systems, Magma and Sage, um, have a lot of these functions implemented in them already. And so you can use those functions, um, those native uh, functions. So hopefully you'll get some, some experience uh, doing that. Um, so I just want to end with kind of talking about the properties of these beautiful um, super singular isogeny graphs. So um, just to go back to this uh, slide here, um, there's a couple of uh, things that we assumed in our original paper in 2005, and that is that if you assume that P is congruent to 1 mod 12, then what happens is that there's no extra automorphisms for any of the elliptic curves. And think of an automorphism in the, in the graph as being kind of a self loop. It's like an extra little self loop, which is you know kind of annoying when you're talking about regularity and stuff. So if you don't have any of these extra little self loops, if P is one mod 12, then what you, what you can do is you can collapse edges. So you've got isogeny is quotienting by a subgroup. So it's going out. So it starts at one elliptic curve and it really seems like it's directional. It goes out. But isogenies also have a dual isogeny. And what we can do is we can associate the dual isogeny with the original isogeny and collapse them into one edge. And that's what makes it an undirected graph. So that's kind of always how I think of it. And in, um, so that's what we mean also when we say L, so L plus one regular. So after you've kind of collapsed these um, edges, uh, an isogeny with its dual, every, um, one of these elliptic curves, when L is, is co-prime to P, you've got the L torsion is uh, isomorphic to the abelian group Z mod L cross Z mod L. And there are, if L is prime, 
there are L plus one distinct subgroups of order L, of Z mod L cross Z mod L. So that makes this an L plus one regular graph. So for example, if L is equal to two, going back to the example I gave earlier of the hash function, if L is two, this is a three regular graph and you can read off the input bits bit by bit for walking around the graph. So that's what you should always have in mind. Very large P, very small L, in, in other words, L equals two. Uh, the Ramanujan property, we're probably gonna have to talk about some other time. So I'd like to just leave you um, with this picture. So this is um, an article that was published in Science Magazine in 2008, so 13 years ago now. And it was written by Dana McKenzie. He heard me talk about these hash functions at one of the AMS um, joint mathematical meetings. And he wrote this article about the ongoing hash function competition and about our proposal to make hash functions from these super singular isogeny graphs. And so we created with my co-authors, Dennis Charles and Ayal Gorin, we created this picture, which is now shown a lot uh, by cryptographers in the area. And so if you, you know, if you didn't pay attention to anything else I was saying about super singular isogeny graphs and you just wanted to keep a picture in your mind, you could keep this picture. So, so why this picture? So look at, there's a lot of, all the circles here are supposed to be vertices. And I think I took the prime to be like something like 25, 21, 2,521. You can check, make sure that the, that, that is actually prime if I'm remembering it right. And what I didn't get into yet is the fact that the size of the graph for a given prime is given by the Eichler class number and it's roughly P over 12. There's the exact formula in, in Silverman. It's P, greatest integer part of P over 12 plus either zero uh, or one or two. And so if you divide 25, 21 by 12, you get that's a little bit more than 200 vertices. So what you're looking at here is about 200 vertices. And all of these lines are, are the edges. And the, the, the overwhelming um, experience that you're supposed to have here is looking at this is that it should look very jumbled. So in other words, it doesn't look like it has any orientation or any pattern or any structure to it. So if you take two random vertices, so I think in this one, we took the vertex one and the vertex like 24, in order to find a path between them, you've got this blue path that kind of goes all over the place. You know, starting from the vertex one, you really would, there's no orientation. You wouldn't know what direction to go in to find this, um, this other vertex 24. And then the red thing is a cycle. So suppose you wanna find a cycle in the graph. You don't have any real way of going, uh, you know, knowing which direction to go in to find a cycle. And so that is consistent with the, the, the property of optimal expander graphs or Ramanujan graphs. Um, the, the theorems that we have there say that for, you, you know, op, for expander graphs, as you walk around, if you take uh, a min, some minimum number of steps that is roughly log P, that you should quickly uh, approximate the uniform distribution on the graph. So you don't really have any notion of, you know, kind of a better way to go to get to some other random, random vertex. So um, the, uh, I think that my time is, is up and I will end with that and we'll, we'll keep going on the rest of the slides um, on the next lecture. I'd be happy to make the slides available to, um, I'll find out from the conference organizers how to, how to share them with all of you so you can see them. So thanks everybody. Okay, let's thank Kristen for that nice talk. Are there any uh, questions? I have a question. Uh, near the end, you said something about uh, choosing P to be one mod 12 in order to uh, make the graph undirected. Could you say something about why it matters that it's one mod 12? Yeah, so um, if you have, uh, if it's, if P is one mod 12, then you won't have any extra um, automorphisms 
on any of the super singular elliptic curves uh, mod p and an extra automorphism is like a little loop that's like an extra kind of edge in the graph in a sense that you don't really want to be there. So it turns out that uh, like if you look at Pizer's original paper, uh, Ramanujan graphs from basically like Eichler orders in quaternion algebras, he assumes that P is one mod 12. And for this reason, like we also thought it was important and nice, easy way to make the graph undirected, all of that. But um, in, I didn't get to the key exchange part of this talk, but these days for, um, the psych super singular isogeny key exchange, they're often using primes that are not one mod 12. And so I worried a little bit. I was like, well, wait a minute, wouldn't there be extra edges around? And well, you know, could that mess up the system? And Yana actually did some, some experiments. I mean, she can tell you more about it, but there's um, very little reason to worry, actually, even if you don't have P is one mod 12. There, there might still be some kind of weird attack that we could, could come up with, but it only affects a very small number of the vertices. So if you look at um, really special super singular elliptic curves, like where J equals zero or J equals 1728. So one of them is a curve that you'll be looking at in one of the exercises, just like y squared equals x cubed plus x. You have um, kind of extra automorphisms there. And, uh, but if you ignore these very few, very small number of vertices where there's an extra automorphism, it seems like it doesn't really matter that they're using, um, that they're not imposing the condition P is congruent to one mod 12 for the key exchange. There are a couple other questions in the chat, but it looks like they've been answered by Yana. Any Excellent. other questions for Kristen? So could I ask again uh, one other question about uh, those automorphism when P is not equal to one mod 12? Because if I understand correctly, not Morphism will be an isogeny of degree one. So how are they going to appear on the L isogeny graph? Oh, I'm sorry, you're right. There, it, it doesn't appear, but what it does is if you compose it with one of the edges, it'll look like it's uh, different than, the, uh, than what it is without being composed with it. So it'll make the graph look like it has double edges. Do you see what I mean? Yes, it's okay. It would be like a very short cycle. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. In general, thanks for asking again. So in general, in our original paper, we actually imposed not just P is congruent to one mod 12. We proposed that we put many more congruence conditions on P, which will um, make it impossible to have really short cycles. And that's because um, if you have a cycle of length two or, or length three, it corresponds to certain elements with a certain trace and norm. And um, it will in, uh, basically ensure that you have a, a specific imaginary quadratic field embedded into that quaternion algebra. And if you put conditions on P that basically disallow such embeddings, then it means that you cannot have those short cycles for that L and that P. And so um, this is an example, like we put P congruent to one mod 12, and that means no two cycles, and then et cetera, et cetera. The, the, unfortunately, the congruence conditions, um, if you wanna disallow three cycles, four cycles, five cycles, all that, it makes the, um, the congruence condition, um, pushes the size of the prime up and up and up very quickly. Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, let's thank Kristen again for her lecture. Thanks everyone, see you Wednesday.